Well, there they are. Our new electronic media or our new gadgets. You push a button and the world's yours. You know how they talk about the world getting smaller? Well, it's thanks to these that it is. Everywhere is now our own neighborhood. We know what it's like to go on safari in Kenya or to have an audience with the Pope, to order a cognac in a Paris cafe. But not only is the world getting smaller, it's becoming more available and more familiar to our minds and to our emotions. The world is now a global village. A global village. Well, if the appliance store is the symbol of the age uh, we're living in now, uh, what about the symbol of the age just past? Because in contrast to all of this, we used to have just one medium, or one gadget, if you like. John? Come on around. You're in a bookstore in the hallowed, respectable center of the age of print, the age of the book. In the appliance store, you're very much the electronic man. Here, you go back to being a renaissance man, literary man. A book. It's all we used to have. There were no film projectors, no TV sets or radios. We got all our information from this. We were educated by it. We learned about each other from it. The book was the source of our fame. We lived, loved, and died, as the saying goes, by the book. Think for a minute of uh, how one reads. One sits alone, one's eye scans a line at a time. The author's ideas come to you one at a time off the page. It's a private experience. It's not a community or family activity. You do this alone. The uh, electronic media haven't wiped out the book. It's read and used and wanted, perhaps more than ever. But the role of the book has changed. It's no longer alone. It no longer has sole charge of our outlook nor our sensibilities. Of course, the trouble is we act as though we were still solely in the age of the book. Our notions of right and wrong, our regard for one another, for education, diplomacy, politics, religion, all belong to the literary man. And perhaps that's why a literary man finds things today coarse or corrupt or materialistic. He hears the sound of fighting in the street, of the uh, rough and tumble of life. Sometimes he hears the sound of music, and uh, he finds it all rather vulgar. With me now is Marshall McLuhan. Well, Marshall, you've done a considerable amount of writing about media. Uh, what does this all mean, the uh, book world that we had and the electronic world we have? I think the best distinction, Alan, might be found in the phrase, with it. You know how we speak of being with it, meaning we've understood completely. We, we've got the message, as it were, in every way possible. But in the older book or print culture, people were not with it. Uh, they were away from it by themselves with their own private point of view. Now, you have no point of view when you're with it because you accept the thing totally. And we're with it because these new media of ours, the one you talked about in the appliance store, have made our world into a single unit. The world is now like a continually sounding tribal drone where everybody gets the message all the time. A princess gets married in England, and boom, boom, boom go the drums. We all hear about it. An earthquake in North Africa, a Hollywood star gets drunk, away go the drums again. I use the word tribal. It is probably the key word of this whole half hour. Why, Marshall, do you use the word tribal? Why, why this? Well, I think you'll find everything we observe tonight about the media uh, points in the direction of tribal man and away from individual man. Now, by individual man, I assume that you're referring to John's literary man. Yes, uh, and, and tribal man is the man created by the new electronic media. So that this would be the basic change we spoke of at the beginning. Yes, we're retribalizing. Involuntarily, we're getting rid of individualism. We're in a process of making a tribe. For just as books and their private point of view are being replaced by the new media, so the concepts which underlie our actions our social life are changing. We are no longer so concerned with self-definition, with finding our own individual way. Uh, what the group, we, we're more concerned with what the group knows, of feeling as it does, of acting with it, not apart from it. Look, uh, let's back up just a bit, Marshall. Uh, no. 
if more books are being used, more being sold, uh, the libraries are crowded, they're busy, how can it be said, aside from what else may be happening, that we're moving out of a print culture? As John said, uh, books are still very important, but their role is changing. The nature of their importance is changing. Remember that books were our first teaching machine, and during the Renaissance, our only teaching machine. Uh, books are what gave the Renaissance its peculiar stamp. We had to see the world and each other's through the printed line on the page. And today, there are many media of information, many teaching machines. By teaching machines, I take it that you're not referring only to those found in the classroom. No, no, no. We, we learn everywhere. The book's role has diminished <clears throat> because of all the other actors. It's no longer king, but subject. We owe a lot to the book. The assembly line uh, of mass production, that, for example, comes to us from the book, from the printed line where things move along and happen one at a time. But the assembly line has changed. It is no longer one thing at a time, but wherever possible, everything at once. Forty or fifty operations happening at the same time, controlled and synchronized exactly by preset type. Tape. Notice the shift in the image. From the assembly line stretched out, events taking place one at a time to the modern automated industrial complex where things happen all at once. Bang. Not a line, but a field. And this applies not only to products, but to people. The line, the individual event was the book. The field, the all at once, tribal drum, the new medium. Yes, but I mean, our media, uh, is any medium that strong that it can affect our lives and our whole outlook, Marshall? Uh, aren't media, as I think most of us feel, on the edges of life. Uh, they can be taken or left alone. Well, Alan, we've seen how print affected all aspects of our lives. Industry, education, the concept of the modern army even. Our managerial class is a product of print culture. So is the idea of romantic love. The media are at the heart of our life because the media work through our senses. And print is a medium. Uh, it changed our sense makeup from what it had been in the Middle Ages. And now, certainly, these other media will do the same. They, the photo photo uh, photograph, movies, radio, TV, all these uh, change at once the way in which we see or hear or touch or feel ourselves and our world. A slight change of one of our five senses alters the ratio among the rest. People suddenly begin to want and appreciate different things. They begin to think differently. All right, but let's uh, get back to your earlier word, tribal, Marshall. Uh, why should all of this talk about media mean that individual man is on the way out and tribal man is on the way in? I mean, why is the big change taking place? To answer that, let's get back to the teenager, for he illustrates the changes brought about by media in the clearest way, especially if we contrast the teenager with his old-time contemporary, the adolescent. Whoa. <laughs> you mean there's a difference between the adolescent and the teenager? Yes, and I'd say it's the same kind of difference as that between book culture and the electronic era. The adolescent corresponds to the world of the book, the teenager to the electronic era. The adolescent is seeking self-definition, seeking to isolate his uniqueness from that of others, seeking to relate his self uh, to others. The adolescent knew he wasn't an adult. He knew he was in life's waiting room, that his life was not really real life. That would begin only with adulthood. The adolescent is still our image of what the young person should be. 